the world has reached a global population of 6.7 billion people. That's an interesting fact to consider as we see a rise in the cost of food, greater evidence of environmental damage, and a dramatic increase in the price of gasoline. The world's population exploded over the course of the last century, mainly due to advances in medicine and technology. While the good news in this development is apparent, it also presents challenges for the international community. Robert Engelman is the author of More, Population, Nature, and What Women Want. He has studied the effect of population growth on the planet and says we are entering into dangerous territory if population growth rates continue to increase. Where we are right now is that we have a world of 6.7 billion people, and we know that we are overwhelming the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. We know that we have falling water tables in almost every part of the world where water tables are measured. We have a significant loss of biodiversity, that is the biological wealth uh, that was here when we arrived on the planet. And all of these things relate to the number of people and the behavior of people around the world. However, issues of limiting reproduction can cause political and ethical controversy. In a diverse world with a wide range of religious and cultural views, it can often be difficult to form a common consensus on what steps should be taken to limit population numbers, or if any steps should be taken at all. One controversial program to limit population growth is China's one child per family rule. In China, having more than one child without government consent can lead to fines and penalties and sometimes even forced abortions and sterilization. The one child per family policy has led to an imbalance of genders in the country since most families in China often prefer to have males. Don Fetter was a longtime conservative columnist for the Boston Herald and has worked on a movie called Demographic Winter, The Decline of the Human Family. Fetter warns that conditions in China could prove problematic for the country looking forward. There, there is that, that one child per family policy. That child has led to a growing imbalance between men and women to the point where there are millions of men in China today who will never be able to find a wife. There's nothing more dangerous to a society than men, especially young men, men in their teens, 20s, and 30s without women. And that's the situation you're coming to in China. Compulsory reproductive control is by no means the only way to go about limiting population growth. Unlike China, India has been a democratic state since it gained its independence from England. India's government used to limit access to birth control and education for women, but those old trends are starting to change. Indians, especially women, largely were unsatisfied with their government's policies towards birth control, instead preferring that the decision remain in the family. Ellen Marshall is an editor for RH Reality Check, a website that reports news and reproductive health. Having been involved in the issue of population growth for years, Ellen believes that India can be an example for how a country with relatively poor citizens can still make an effort to limit their population. The government trying to set a policy about making those private decisions about how many children to have, and then there was great rebellion in India about that, saying, no, our families should be able to decide. And once they got back into um, a system of having voluntary access to family planning services and contraceptives, while also bringing up the, you know, in some places far better than others, but again, right. the educational attainment where people, when girls stay in school and aren't getting married or um, sold off by their families at a young age, um, that in itself starts delaying when people start having children. Oftentimes, one of the barriers to contraception is religion. Different religions and churches have various opinions on the role of contraception, usually in opposition. Interestingly, though, religions may have more lobbying power within their own government than amongst their constituents. In writing his book, Bob Engelman interviewed women of many different religions and generally found that they believed women should at least have the access to contraception as a means of family planning. I interviewed women who were Catholics, uh, women who were Islamic or participated in various kinds of, uh, of Islam, and, uh, and almost all of them said to me that they wanted the right and the ability to decide for themselves whether or when to have children, and that they weren't troubled, or if they were troubled, it wasn't enough to keep them from, from doing this <laughs> by the fact that in some cases they felt their religion disapproved of, of them using family planning. It's really more a problem at the level of governments. Religions have lots, have much, they have much more impact on governments than they have on individual women and men. Poverty can also be a contributing factor, as many of the countries with the highest birth rates also face extreme challenges with medical care, political and economic instability, and education. 
Thus, impoverished people often cannot afford access to family planning methods, even if there is a place they can go to seek counseling. I think it's clear that historically and in the past that population growth has contributed to poverty. Uh, there certainly have been historical examples where um, populations did grow beyond the capacities of uh, societies to produce food, or they contributed to plagues or disease outbreaks because of high population density that certainly contributed to impoverishment uh, as well as to death and right. loss of health. Where it is now is a bit harder to say, but there's certainly uh, a good case to be made that families, for example, at the micro level, families, poor families who aren't able to manage their own childbearing or, or decide when to have children or when not to, uh, are, are less resilient in the face of economic volatility because of the numbers of children that they are trying to raise. However, limiting population growth can also present economic challenges to nations. One example of where lower birth rates may have contributed to a declining economy is Japan. Don Fetter examined late 80s, early 90s Japan as an example for demographic winter. Fetter believes that because Japan's birth rates declined after World War II, there were demographic and economic imbalances that led to a fiscal freefall. Japan's economy took a nosedive back in the 1990s. You may recall in the 1980s, Everybody was concerned about Japan, Inc. They were going to take over the world. Exactly. In the 1990s, Japan's stock market fell 80% from an all-time high. Its real estate market lost 60% of its value. Now, people, economists discussing that generally don't talk about declining birth rates in that regard. But you've never had an example in the course of history of a robust economy with falling birth rates. In the U.S., there is a growing concern that the baby boomer generation is going to put stresses on Social Security. We, too, will be going through a demographic shift with a growing amount of retired seniors and with a current national birth rate of around 2.1 children per woman. This will lead to a decreased workforce, which could hurt our economy, but it will also reduce the amount of limited resources we use. With the cost of food and gas ever increasing, Ellen Marshall notes that even though we may have a lower birth rate than some impoverished countries, our impact on the economy and the environment is just as significant with far less people. Between 2000 and 2050, the U.S. is going to add about 114 million people. Now, the continent of Africa at that same time is going to add about 1.2 billion people. So there's the people issue. But then you look at the carbon emissions are going to be about the same. I think looking at any of these things in their I think it's kind of cute and easy to say there aren't people to support, you know, people going into Social Security. Well, we might have to look at the policies differently. The issue of birth control and reproductive rights is always a hot-button topic in America, and recently the issue has led to a clash between conservative and progressive leadership. The Department of Health and Human Services is moving to have forms of contraception, such as the morning-after pill and IUDs, classified as abortion a decision that could reduce access to birth control for millions of Americans requiring public aid. Senator Hillary Clinton recently wrote an op-ed piece to fight the decision, publishing it on both the Huffington Post and RH Reality Check. Ellen Marshall, an editor of RH, explains the possible ramifications of the administration's decision. Whether it's to have publicly supported contraceptive services for those people who can't afford them on their own, or to ensure that health insurance programs cover contraception or having public health insurance programs cover embryos but not cover the health care of the woman right. in whom the embryo is. I mean, this has just been on and on and on. And so I sadly say it's no surprise. Global population growth is seemingly an unstoppable force and a natural one. However, it seems that our most basic, functional purpose may lead to difficult challenges in the future. For You Are Here, I'm Dan Wyman, 88.9 FM.